Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to come back. Um, and I'm honored to speak at this event. So um, for this talk, uh, this talk is in the uh, general area of uh, frame theory, which, as is known, uh, started with the study of non-harmonic Fourier series and then became immensely, immensely popular due to applications in signal processing. So um, we will start by looking at um, equiangular sets of lines, that is, uh, equispaced, uh, loosely speaking, equispaced uh, lines. Um, and uh, we would consider a dependent set, in which case we will um, refer to them as equiangular frames. And then we will consider some generalizations. In particular, we instead of requiring the angles, uh, the, the vectors to be equispaced, we will um, consider sets where the angles between any two disjoint vectors can take k different values. Um, and then, uh, in the context of signal processing, when we use these sets to represent signals, then we have to also uh, think about the dual sets. And we are interested in looking at the angular properties of the duals, which means that if we have an equiangular frame, then uh, what would the angular property of the dual frame be? So with that, um, we start with a system of n lines in RD passing through the origin. And in order to make things interesting, we want that any two make the same angle phi between 0 and pi by 2. So we avoid the extreme cases of 0 and pi by 2, where 0 would imply that the lines are overlapping, and pi by 2 would mean that they are uh, um, orthonormal set. And so we want n to be greater than d. Now, for each line, on each line, we choose a unit vector, let's call fi. And if it's an equiangular system, then the inner product between any two distinct vectors would be plus or minus cosine the angle. Uh, for convenience, we'll refer to that as plus or minus alpha. And since um, we are considering unit vectors, the inner product between a vector and itself would be 1. And um, for the sake of computation, we will next consider the matrix of inner products, which is known as the Gram matrix. Um, so these are the matrix of inner products. And just from this property, we can see that the matrix G, which is the Gram matrix, would have a diagonal that is all 1. And the off-diagonal entries would be plus or minus alpha. So that implies that the Gram matrix can be written in this way as the sum of the identity plus alpha times a matrix S. This matrix S now becomes critical because it contains most of the pertinent information regarding uh, this equiangular set of lines. So this matrix S is called the signature matrix. And it is going to be n by n when we consider a set of n vectors. Uh, it's going to have 0 diagonal because the diagonal of the Gram matrix is all ones, which has been incorporated in the identity. So S has 0 diagonal. and the off-diagonal entries will be plus or minus 1. And of course, it's going to be symmetric because the Gram matrix is symmetric. So this matrix, called the signature matrix, is going to be a key object in the study of these equiangular systems of lines. So starting from a system of equiangular lines, we can actually bring it down to the study of this n by n symmetric matrix. And actually, this has a connection to graphs, which we will not um, discuss in this talk, but I just wanted to mention. Uh, you can think of this matrix, which we call the signature matrix, at the, as the adjacency matrix of graphs having n vertices, where um, the ijth entry of the signature matrix is going to be negative 1 if the ijth vertex is adjacent, and the ijth entry of this matrix is going to be 1 if the ijth vertex is non-adjacent. So there is a strong connection between these systems of equiangular lines and graphs, which we will not um, discuss here, but I th it's worth mentioning this. So just as we can start from here and bring it down to the study of these signature matrices, there's also a converse where for any matrix that has this property, we can actually connect that to a system of equiangular lines in this way. Actually, back here, it's worth observing that the Gram matrix, when you have more lines than the dimension, will at least the minimum eigenvalue is going to be always 0. Uh, the the non-zero eigenvalues will be positive. And so the, eigen, one of the, the minimum eigenvalue of the signature matrix is going to be negative 1 over alpha. 
So with that observation, if we start with a matrix, which is a signature matrix, meaning having those properties of so zero diagonal, off diagonal entries, plus or minus one, symmetric, so on, and whose minimum eigenvalue is theta, then this matrix is then going to be the gram matrix of some set of n equiangular lines in Rd, where now the dimension is uh, the number of lines minus the multiplicity of the minimum eigenvalue. So in this way, there is actually a one-to-one -one correspondence between equiangular systems of lines spanning Rd and all signature matrices whose minimum eigenvalue has multiplicity n minus the dimension. So we can go back and forth, and the study of one now reduces to the study of the other. So if we are trying to study systems of equiangular lines, we actually reduce that to the study of these matrices. So as you will see, most of the results here can be obtained uh, from tools borrowed from linear algebra. All right, so now uh, one might wonder about the bounds of such lines. How many, what is the maximum number of equiangular lines can you get in a given uh, dimension? So uh, this was a result that's uh, been around for a long time. Uh, and it says that the maximum number of n equiangular lines is bounded above by this number, d times d plus 1 by 2, if you are in Rd. And if you are in Cd, then it is bounded by d squared. There is another bound, which is popularly known as the Welch bound, which gives a relationship between the angles and in, in terms of the inner products, and also the number of lines and the dimension. And so it says that if you take n unit vectors, then the maximum inner product is bounded below by this number, which is called um, the Welch bound. And it is of special interest uh, when this bound is actually attained. When would you have equality? And systems of lines where equality is held are called equiangular tight frames. And when the equality is attained, then the inner product between any two vectors actually takes the same value, which is this bound, in considering the absolute value. So um, if you look at this, then you can see that um, thinking of the inner product as a measure of the coherence between disjoint vectors, this bound tells us that this is the um, this is the worst that can, that can happen, um, or the best. This is the best that can happen. So equiangular tight frames, when they attain this bound, they actually minimize the maximum coherence. And because of this property, they have um, become, uh, they, they have gained a lot of interest, and they have lots of applications. Um, just to mention a few, they, are, they have been shown to be robust under erasures, meaning that if some of the vectors are um, deleted when you use these for, um, for, for representing signals, or in other words, if the coefficients in the signal representation are lost, then sets of lines which attain this bound have been uh, shown to be uh, robust. And they have also found applications in coding theory, quantum information processing, and other, other areas. These are just some representative leading work. There's a lot of other work that has been done. Uh, there is a lot of literature in this um, that I have not cited in the interest of space. Um, so this is the most popular example of an equiangular tight frame known as the Mercedes-Benz frame. Uh, you can think of this as the cube roots of unity. Uh, three vectors, 120 degrees apart. You can also think of them as the vertices of an equilateral triangle inscribed in, an, in a unit circle. These are the vectors. They are all unit norm. The inner product between any two is actually negative one half, considering the absolute value, that's just one half. And if you look at this matrix F, whose columns are these vectors, then the matrix times its uh, transpose is a multiple of the identity and the multiple is the size of the set divided by the dimension. And this is actually nothing special to this particular set. If you take an uh, equiangular tight frame of n vectors in Rd, or a d-dimensional space, then this, um, this constant is n over d, the size over the dimension. All right, so just to recap, so by equiang in equiangular tight frames, we have this property where the inner product between any two in absolute value takes the same value, which is the Welch bound. And we are going to use this terminology, NDETF, to indicate uh, 
and a triangular tight frame of n vectors in a d-dimensional space. And the tightness is manifested in the fact that the matrix whose columns are the vectors is going to be this multiple of the identity. So if you think of this as a matrix, then since it's a multiple of the identity, it has one eigenvalue, which is n over d. So this, this is the matrix of outer products. If you think of the gram matrix, which is the matrix of inner products, then the gram matrix will have two eigenvalues. The, this matrix and this matrix will have the same non-zero eigenvalues. So the gram matrix will have an additional eigenvalue, which is zero. So the gram matrix has only two eigenvalues. One is n over d, which is the same as this one, and the other one is going to be zero with these multiplicities. So the problem uh, of existence of ETFs is, uh, uh, is an another interesting problem because these ETFs, they don't exist in many cases. They are rare. And so there are very few pairs, N, D, for which, for which ETFs exist. Uh, one example is that there are no ETFs of five vectors in R3. However, the good news is that if you um, are in a d-dimensional space, then you can always have d plus one vectors in the d-dimensional space that can form an EDF. And these come from the vertices of a regular simplex. So you saw the Mercedes-Benz frame, which was in R2, and those came from the vertices of a triangle. In R3, they would come from the vertices of a tetrahedron, and so on. So um, now I would like to show you a very explicit construction of d plus one equiangular vectors in Rd. Uh, so just to um, recap what we already said, so the gram matrix can be written in this way. Alpha is the Welsh bound, S is the signature matrix. These are the eigenvalues of the gram matrix, which means that the eigenvalues of the signature matrix uh, would be these two numbers. If I am trying to find d plus one vectors in Rd, which are equiangular uh, or which form an ETF, then n would be d plus one, alpha is going to be this value, uh, which comes from the Welch bound, and the eigenvalues of s would be negative d and one. And so the problem then reduces to actually finding matrices that have this eigenvalue property. And once you can do that, because there is a one-to-one -one correspondence, you can go back and construct the vectors that would form an ETF. So that brings us to this result, which is a constructive characterization of all signature matrices for d plus one d real or complex ETFs. Um, this is uh, uh, work with my former student, and it's a very simple result, and it gives a nice construction of signature matrices for d plus one d ETFs. And the signature matrices, it's a necessary and sufficient condition, and the signature matrices just come from the identity minus x times x transpose, where x is a complex valued vector with unimodular entries. And that's all you need. And then from there, you get the signature matrix and you can construct the vectors back. So as an example, for a 4-3 EDF, where the Welch bound is going to be one over three, we can take x to be the vector where all the entries are ones. Then the signature matrix is going to be this matrix whose diagonal is zero, off diagonal entries are all negative one. And from there, we can get the gram matrix. So the inner product between any two distinct vectors is negative one third, so they are all the same. Um, and if you are wondering how to actually get the frame vectors, that's actually quite simple. Because the gram matrix is a self-adjoint matrix, it has this kind of a factorization in terms of a unitary uh, matrix. So U is unitary, which is made up of the eigenvectors of the gram matrix. And what we do is, so here the eigenvalues, these are the eigenvalues of the gram matrix. Because the gram matrix is rank deficient, it will have N minus D eigenvalues that are zero. Uh, and so we just ignore N minus D columns and we just look at the first D columns of U. So we look at the sub matrix that come from the first D columns of U and the rows of this sub matrix will give us the vectors that correspond to the um, ETF that we are looking for. And this, is, this just works for any size. Uh, and so in particular, from this matrix, you can get back the corresponding um, EDF. So now we want to actually think about generalizations. So we have 
a set of unit vectors, uh, which is a spanning set in RD. And now we look at this set, which is the set of all possible inner products between distinct vectors. So for an EDF, the size of this set is one because there is only one angle. And our aim is to actually generalize and construct uh, vectors for which this size is k, where k is preferably small, um, but k is going to be greater than one if it is not equiangular. And such sets will be referred to as uh, k angle frames. So um, this is how this can be done. And actually, the construction is based on the construction of d plus 1 d ETFs that we already talked about. Uh, the construction is quite simple, actually. So we actually start with a k that is less than or equal to the given dimension. So this is the maximum number of angles that we will allow our set to have. And then we start with this set, which is an ETF in RD, where the inner product between any two distinct vectors is negative 1 over D. And I just showed you an example how that can be done for the four, three case, but it can be done for any. Um, if we go back here, so instead of taking x to be all 1, uh, instead of taking x to be a vector of size 4, you just take whatever size you want. And if you take them to be all 1s, then you will get a gram matrix where off-diagonal entries will be all negative 1 over D. In this case, D was 3. So this particular set can always be constructed, and a particular example was shown in the previous slide. And then for this set, we look at all possible subsets of size k. And we are going to denote those by lambda i. And so if we think about all possible subsets of size k, then you can have d plus 1 choose k such subsets. So for each such subset of this set, we are going to just take this average, we are going to sum them, and we are going to normalize it, and we get a new set of vectors denoted by gi's, where g is of size d dashed. So it comes from all possible subsets of this starting EDF. And this actually turns out to be a k angle tight frame. So the number of angles is bounded above by k. And this k is actually for us to choose. So we have some control on how many angles we can get. And since, um, in the interest of time, I will not be showing you the proof, but let me just comment. Uh, the critical part is to note that the denominator here, that is the size, um, is actually independent of which subset you take. So for any i, this denominator is always constant. And uh, the number of angles is obtained by some, it's a slightly complicated counting problem. And the fact that it's a tight frame uh, comes from showing that the frame potential attains a certain, uh, certain value. Um, those of you who are familiar with that know. So, um, so yeah, so that's how, that's how that's done. And now we are going to move on to the part on the duals of equiangular frames. So we start with a unit norm type frame. And uh, this provides a redundant representation for any vector in the space. So any vector can be written in this way. So here you can see that there are two vectors that we need. Here, both of them are the same. So the coefficients are calculated with respect to the set phi. And the representation is also in terms of the same set. Uh, this, is, this is a property of being a tight frame. So if we relax that, if it is not a tight frame, we can no longer use the same set to represent as well as to calculate the coefficients. So if it is not tight, then the coefficients are calculated with respect to the frame vectors. Uh, phi, and then we need another set in order to uh, represent the, uh, the vector f. So this, this set of vectors that are used, uh, denoted by tildes, uh, is called the dual of the, of the set phi. And when it is a tight frame, in particular if it is a nd unit norm tight frame, then these dual vectors are just multiples of the frame vectors. And because of this, you can note that um, for an ND ETF, the inner product between the dual frame vectors, between any two disjoint or distinct uh, dual frame vectors, is going to be a constant. And that's because we started with an equiangular frame. And so the inner product between any two distinct vectors is, uh, is alpha. Uh, that is how, what we started with. And because the dual frame vectors are just a constant times the frame vectors, so this also is going to be constant. It's going to be different from alpha, of course, but it's still going to be a constant. Uh, 
So this means that both the frame phi and the dual phi tilde, they have a nice geometric structure. So one is equiangular and the other one is equiangular as well. So that's, that's a very nice property and uh, we would like to have that. However, this happens for, for an equiangular tight frame but not necessarily in other cases. And the problem is that we already mentioned that these ETFs, they are very rare. They don't always exist. So we can't always have that property in both the frame and its dual. So the, question, the, the idea, therefore, is if we can sacrifice tightness and if we can find a frame that is equiangular, but maybe the dual isn't, equi isn't equiangular, but maybe it is k-angular for small k. So um, for, a, for a unit norm tight frame, the matrix F whose columns are the frame vectors is this multiple of the identity. And so we noted already that the gram matrix has only two distinct eigenvalues. One is zero, the other one is N over D. So in, in sacrificing the tightness part, we will be sacrificing this particular property, which means that we are looking at the gram matrix that has more than two distinct eigenvalues. So if it doesn't have two distinct eigenvalues, it is no longer tight. So that is what we want to look at. So if the gram matrix has more than two distinct eigenvalues, because of this relationship between the gram matrix and the signature matrix, the signature matrix will also have more than two distinct eigenvalues. So the next choice, if it doesn't have two distinct eigenvalues, is to look at signature matrices that have three distinct eigenvalues and see what we can say. And actually, signature matrices with three distinct eigenvalues um, have been studied extensively in the context of constructing large sets of equiangular lines. Not constructing, but just studying the properties of large sets of equiangular lines. And there is this paper by Greaves um, and others um, that actually discuss this quite extensively. Um, and so, for any signature matrix, we can correspond a particular equiangular frame, which we saw at the start. You can decompose and we can um, go back. And so now what we want to do is we want to look at the distinct inner products of the dual. And in particular, the dual, if we go back here, this dual is actually not unique. There are many sets, because this is no longer a basis, it's a redundant uh, set, this is no longer unique. Uh, but we are going to look at one special uh, dual, which we call the canonical dual. And for that, um, we are going to uh, see how many distinct inner products are there between vectors of the canonical dual. So here is an example. I mentioned at the start that it, a, a 5-3 equiangular tight frame does not exist. However, we have a 5-3 equiangular frame from this signature matrix. So starting from the signature matrix, you can construct the gram matrix, then factorize it, get the frame vectors. For this signature matrix, these are the eigenvalues. So we have three distinct eigenvalues, negative square root of 5, 0, and square root of 5. The gram matrix is going to look like this. So you can see that the, you have an equiangular frame because the off-diagonal entries are all plus or minus 1 over square root of 5. So that is an equiangular frame. Now, for the canonical dual, the gram matrix actually happens to be the pseudo inverse of the gram matrix of the frame. And so if you calculate the pseudo inverse, you get this matrix. If you study this matrix, uh, carefully, you will see that the diagonal entries are all the same, and the off-diagonal entries take two values, which means that here, for this case, where we did not have an equiangular tight frame, we had an equiangular frame, the dual actually is a two-angle frame, but is equal norm. The norm is all the same. Um, so that is an interesting example. To, uh, to show us that even if the dual isn't equiangular, it still can, we still can, it's possible, maybe under some conditions, to actually control the number of, number of angles. So um, here is a, a more recent result in that context, uh, jointly with uh, Ulla Christensen and uh, Ray Young Kim. And so here we start with a signature matrix that is n by n. And of course, here n represents the size of the set. 
Uh, and here we have three distinct eigenvalues, negative lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3 in order. Uh, because the signature matrix has zero diagonal, it has zero trace, so at least one of the eigenvalues will be negative. So the smallest eigenvalue will be negative. And corresponding to this, we have an equiangular frame, which we denote by phi. And so here are the con some conditions uh, under which we can say something about the angles of the dual. So we have these two, not the minimum, but the next two, either one of them. If either lambda 2 or lambda 3 is a simple eigenvalue, meaning that it's not repeated as a root of the characteristic polynomial, with a regular eigenvector, by regular eigenvector I mean an eigenvector where each entry is either plus or minus 1. Um, then the canonical dual is an equal norm frame, like the example that I just showed, with two angles. And this is a frame in n minus mu, where mu is the multiplicity of the signature matrix. So that just comes from the, uh, from the property of the dimension of the space. So that, that is nice. So this, uh, ge this generalizes the example that, that we discussed. And for the minimum eigenvalue, also we can say something. That is the minimum eigenvalue, if it is simple and has a regular eigenvector, then there are two conditions. One is if the eigenvector is just the vector 1, which means that all the entries are 1. Then the canonical dual is, again, a two angle. And in this case, it's going to be in R n minus 1 because it's a simple eigenvector, so its multiplicity is 1. And that determines the dimension. Otherwise, uh, if it is any other regular eigenvector that is not 1, then in this particular case, the canonical dual is going to be an equal norm k angle frame in Rn minus 1, where um, k is between 2 and 4. Um, so that's what we can say. And I, I, again, I did not include the proof here, but the main, uh, the main tool used in the proof is the spectral decomposition of the signature matrix or the gram matrix. Um, that's the main thing. And I don't know how I'm doing with time, but, uh, but yeah, I think, I think I will stop with that maybe and take questions and comments if you have any.